Thank you for joining us for today's message. We believe we can go anywhere in the world from right here in Lamarck, Texas and reach people just like you. If you'd like more information about Abundant Life, please visit ALCC.org. You can also text the number below if you would like to support the church financially. Be ready for a powerful message that's gonna impact your life. I'm speaking on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the working of the Holy Ghost, the way the Spirit of God operates according to the Scripture. No man knows everything about the Holy Spirit, but what I do know, get ready, my job according to the Word of God is to teach you so you'll be able to teach someone else. Amen. Paul said, commit the gospel of faithful men and women that they may be able to teach others also. So I believe that as we go into the Word here, I'll, I'll teach a little bit, but you know I like to preach. So I like to teach and preach both. Somebody once said, teachers tell it, and preachers yell it. So I kind of like a little of both of those, you know. But it's important to know the Word of God and to understand because we have a tendency to, uh, to get into a custom. And so we think our mannerism or our custom is actually the Bible, but our custom is an expression of a revelation and an impact that the Word of God had upon us. That's why we magnify the Lord the way we do. Because how many of you are glad that Jesus has been revealed to you? Amen. The Bible says that God gave His kingdom. Jesus came to bring His kingdom. But everything He wanted you to know, the Scripture says, He hid it. He brought it to you, but it's hid. He said the kingdom of God is like a, a person who buys a field because there's a pearl of great price that's hid in that. So he doesn't just go try to dig up the pearl, he buys the whole field. He hid it until it could be received. Uh, there are hidden truths. There are mysteries. Now listen to me. Uh, what God wants you to know is not hid from you. It's hid for you. <laughs> I want this to drop in your spirit. It's not hidden from you. It's hidden for you. Jesus told His disciples, there's some things I, I'm just not going to tell them. And they said, well, why do you speak it in a mystery? Why are you talking about uh, in, a, in a mystery, in code some way? Why are you telling all these parables? He said, because they don't have ears to hear it, but the ones that have ears, ears to hear it, they're going to understand it. And He begins to reveal things. And He wanted that to be for those who would believe upon Him. They would begin to understand and they would begin to know that, uh, those truths. And we're to know those things. And then we are, according to James, to be doers of those things, not just hearers only. Amen. Can I get two big amens right there? Amen. Very important. So Jesus, after three and a half years of being with His disciples in His ministry, He's now about to go and, uh, to heaven. And He says in uh, John chapter 16... This should be on the sc uh, screen here in just a moment. John chapter 16, verse 7. Everyone say John. John. 16, 16 and 7. Can I read now for a moment? Nevertheless, I tell you, it is expedient for you. Uh, expedient's a, uh, a good word, not necessarily used a lot today in our uh, vocabulary, but it just means to expedite or it means it's important and to your advantage. It's profitable for you. It's to your betterment. It is expedient for you, it's best for you, uh, that I go away. And the disciples are all upset over this kind of teaching. This is the second time He's told them this. And they're real upset that Jesus is saying, I'm going to leave. And they're like, we want to go with you. And He's like, you can't go right now, but later on you can. And when you get there, I'll have a mansion for you. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you are glad the devil can't threaten you with going to heaven? It is expedient. It's to your benefit. It's better for you it, that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, someone say he. he. Look me right in the face. The Holy Ghost is not an it. Amen. It's he, the Spirit of truth. He, the Comforter. He, the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Scripture says, and when he is come... He will reprove. 
the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He said the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord, the third part of the Godhead, the one who lives in you and works through you, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, will reprove. It's an interesting word and it means to convince. I, I don't want to I can get real into the weeds on, with Greek on this if you need me to, but uh, if just take my word for it and then go look it up. Uh, L-E-G-C-H-O, Legco. It means to convince the argument of a truth. It's almost like uh, two attorneys that are uh, debating on something until finally one of them says, okay, this is the way it is, and we finally agree that's the way it is. Uh, it's kind of like husbands and wives when sometimes they both have the, uh, a good motive, let's say, but they see everything from a different perspective. If you weren't in yesterday's uh, seminar, uh, you can't get the tape, so that's it. You missed it. <laughs> but be that as it may, many times that's the way it is until someone is reproved. Not, uh, and it just means to be persuaded or convinced of a truth or a fact. It could also mean to expose uh, or to reveal something that is blocking that up. Uh, so he said, when he, when the Holy Spirit has come, this is Jesus teaching the disciples, let me just teach for a minute here, he will reprove the world of sin. He will convince on the argument of sin. He will, he will expose why sin will make a fool out of you. Can I have a better amen than that? And he said, when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and he will persuade the world of righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. It, it takes a revelation, it takes a word from God for carnal man to want to depart from sin. And it takes a, a revelation, a word from God, the head of the church, Jesus said, to understand the working of the Holy Spirit, how He will begin to persuade you not about self-righteousness, but about His righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah says, in God's sight. But Jesus was made unrighteous for us at Calvary. He took that so you and I could have the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians says uh, that he that knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. One old great apostle of God from many, many years ago, was my father's uh, 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 spiritual father and apostle, let me just say it like this, a man that really impacted my dad. He would come and he would preach. I can remember just as a boy, as a teenager, I heard him make this statement and it still rings in me today because it just arrested me when I heard him say it. He said, if any man is righteous, he is as righteous as God is, or he is not righteous at all. Amen. Our righteousness is only what you and I have in Christ Jesus. The day you understand that you cannot be good enough in the natural to save yourself outside of the blood of Jesus Christ, then a great day has dawned in your life. That's not a license to sin. That's an awareness of your vulnerability and of the fact that you have to have a Savior and only righteousness will be in the presence of God. Amen. So our righteousness is imputed unto us and received by faith. Can I have a big hallelujah? And Jesus is the one who took on the very flesh and the nature of humanity. He died for us. You ready for this? And he alone lived the righteous life. That's why if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things pass away. Your unrighteous nature passed away and all things, but I wish somebody would give God all of the praise right now. The Holy Spirit is who tells you that. When you get that revelation, I promise you, you'll never feel like you have a license to sin. You'll know you have an empowerment to live above sin. Your desire will be to live above sin. And, and uh, uh, first, uh, second John, first John says, and if you sin, not when you sin, but if you sin, you have an advocate. You have a representative before the Father. Shout his name out loud. Jesus. You have a representative before the Father, an advocate. You can ask to be forgiven and God will forgive you. 
When a person is not born again and they ask to be forgiven, that's not even the issue. They first must become saved. Yes. Amen. The problem with sin is not a problem at all to a person who is not saved because they're just on the way to hell. End of the story. Oh, but when Jesus comes in, then if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. You can ask him to forgive you and he will forgive you. And he will, what the Bible says, make all things new. Woo, glory to God. I may buy my own tape. I'm already preaching. Here it is hot up here and I'm sweating preaching. I'm trying to teach. He will convict the world, reprove the world of sin and of judgment. Whew. Wow, that's a big part. Judgment, righteousness and judgment. The Apostle Paul writes 13 books. When you finish reading the book of Revelation that John wrote that Jesus dictated to him, and you begin to read that when you read about a couple of things that just begin to jump out over and over and over. One of them is righteousness and the, God's righteousness. And the second one is his judgment. Yes. And the Holy Spirit will come and convict about that. And the Bible says in the book of Acts, of course, I believe it's chapter 17, when the apostle Paul was at Mars Hill and he is debating and they're listening to his seven topics that he begins to talk about in front of all of the Stoics. When he got to the last two, the one that Jesus died and arose from the dead and that there was coming a day when eternal judgment would come upon all of those who had rejected Jesus as Lord and upon this world, the Bible says they captured him and threw him out of the place and said he's nothing but a babbler. We don't want to talk to him anymore. I'd like to tell you, I don't care how sophisticated and cool and all of the things that we get and we always want to know how we're always good and we're nice and how to be a good person all of that. At the end of the day, here's what's going to happen, church. God is going to look at men and he's going to say, you're either righteous through my son Jesus or judgment comes. But when those, when you and I receive him, the Bible says we pass from judgment unto life. Come on, somebody give God the praise right there. That's what takes place when you are born again. And when you say, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior, you pass from, it's not a philosophical change that will happen in time. It is a, it's an awareness that something has happened on the inside of you. You have changed. You have been born again. You may be a lamb. You may be just a, a little child. You may be just a little a young baby in Christ, but hang on, you're going to grow up and you're not going to be a goat. You're going to be a sheep. Come on, listen to me. You'll mature and you'll grow. You'll develop. It's powerful when Jesus gives you that understanding. He said the Holy Spirit would persuade. He would convince of that. If we don't have time for the Holy Spirit, we don't have time for the teacher who gets inside of the voice of the Word. Amen. Uh, if, you're, if your righteousness is because you listen to Pastor Hallam, I can just tell you right now, you might as well start saying twinkle, twinkle, little star because that's all the power I have. But if you'll believe and allow the Holy Spirit, come on somebody, shout hallelujah. You'll allow the Holy Spirit to work in you, you will become a new creation. It happens two ways. It happens instantly and then it happens progressively. You are changed and you are being changed into his image from glory to glory. You become a new species, uh, a Christian, a whole new species of human. Not from the outside in, from the inside out. The Holy Spirit, come on somebody shout Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying he will convince the world of these things. Verse 11, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Whew. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know about you. I'm kind of happy that Jesus punched the devil in the eye. I have yet many things to say unto you, verse 12. Many things to say unto you. But you cannot bear them. You cannot receive them and digest them yet. How be it when he, somebody shout he. he. The spirit of truth. Three times Jesus uses this term in, in chapter 14, 15, and 16. He wants you to know that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. 
He cannot, he will not, never has and never can tell a lie. Amen. He cannot tell a falsehood. He cannot tell a wrong motive himself. He is the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit talks to you about something, listen. Amen. He's not confused. He's not messed up. He's not deceived, and he doesn't need to know all the facts. If he talks to you, he already knows it. Ecclesiastes uh, 3.11 says, he knows it from the end back to the beginning, not from the beginning to the end. God knows everything about you, and he starts at the end, and then he works backwards to make sure that everything takes place according to his will. The devil tries to, it's like having a book that's already written, and you start reading it from the back forward. Uh, I like to read, and so I, I'm a reader, and I'm a writer. I mess up every book I read in just about, unless it's a, a, an expensive book, and uh, then I only mess it up a little bit. But I like to take notes, because I don't always trust my memory to everything. So I'll make a little note out in the margin. Do y'all make notes in y'all's Bibles? Yeah. I make notes in my Bibles. I highlight them, and, and not just in my Bibles, but in books and stuff. If I'm reading a, a good book of some kind, well, I like to uh, take a note and think about it. I'll probably never read that book again, but I still took that note. Something happens when I write that note down, it helps me to remember. But be that as it may, imagine taking a book that's already been written. So you've read the last part of it, and you know how this thing uh, ends. Now you begin to read it backwards, and as you begin to read it backwards, and you're going back with it like that, all of a sudden you see margins out on the side and you see things out there that are contrary to the story that's in the book. I mean, you're reading it backwards and, 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 and the guy gets out of the cave. Somehow or another he gets away, he escapes. But out in the margin, there's something that's kind of in parentheses added into it some way that says, no, he didn't get out of the cave, he died. And you're like, no, I've already read the back of the book. That's not how this thing happened. But here it is. Somebody wrote that in the margin. Look at me right in the face. Hell tries to write in the margin of your life and try to change the narrative that God has for you. He is a good God. He wants to bless you. And the Holy Spirit, when hell tries to interrupt you, that didn't come from God. That's hell trying to write out in the margin of your life and change what God's plan was for you. You've got one or two, uh, you have one or two uh, opportunities right then. You can either accept it and just add it to the narrative or you can say, uh-uh, no, no, the blood of Jesus erased that. Nope, nope, not going to happen in my life, Jesus' name. And take your stand of faith. That's how God sees your life. He already sees you blessed. He already sees you whole. He already sees answers that you're begging for. Nothing ever surprises God about what you're praying. Amen. He's like, I know that. I just want you to talk to me about it. Now let's go clean up the pages. The Holy Spirit will help you. You say, that doesn't make a lick of sense. God, open your ears. God, open your eyes so you understand what the Scripture is saying. Amen. You say, well, what if I don't erase it? That's the book of your life. I know God wants you to have that wonderful marriage and everything, but who wrote in the margins about the affair? Amen. Amen. That wasn't God's plan. I'm preaching better than your amen. amen. But oh, the blood of Jesus. Come on, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. He knows how to remove every stain. What about that little shortcut I took pastor in the 90s when about four years I was doing dope and stuff? What about all of that when I was in prison? Or what about that time when, when things were going wrong and I, I wasn't doing right? What about that? Well, thank God for the blood of Jesus. I said thank God for the blood. The scripture says, how be it, verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth, has come. That's one of the ways you know you have the Holy Spirit. He talks to you. He tells you what's good and he tells you what's not good. It's really quite simple. Learning to hear his voice is a lifelong, it's a lifelong journey. So your spirit man, your inner man, begins to tune to the voice of God. Listen to me right now, listen. The Word of God and the voice of God sound a lot alike. Amen. And the Spirit of God in you will never violate the Word of God. 
Some guy was married. This is years ago. This is a true story. Guy was married. I don't know. I guess all the ladies were having the women's seminar, so now I'm on that. <laughs> Cindy came home and straightened me out. <laughs> but she does that anyway. But listen, years ago there was, there was a person that I happened to know, and this person was having a, a hard time getting along in their marriage, he and his wife. He said to me, you know, I just married the wrong person. And so, uh, but there is somebody else that I'm really attracted to. And I really think that God is telling me that's the, the real person for me. I said, liar, liar, pants on fire. God's not telling you that. No, that's called L-U-S-T. God doesn't violate his own word. Now, I'm not saying if you go, if you uh, have a divorce and you've gone through a divorce and everything, that God doesn't give you somebody uh, else. You, you pray about it, you put that under the blood, and you believe God for that. Thank God we have a God who knows how to make all things new. Come on, shout amen. amen. But while you're in that marriage and while you're doing what's right, I can just, uh, and that marriage is what is right. Yes. Amen. You may not be doing what's right, but the marriage is right. Yes. The thing for you to do is repent. Turn from anything, make a decision, you're going to live for God. You say, what if I've been married more than, uh, more than, you know, four times? What am I going to do? Well, how about just make a decision that the one you're married to is the last one you're going to be married to and believe God for righteousness now to begin to rule in your life and in your marriage and in your home and begin to work that out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maybe I just helped somebody and... Might have run somebody off. You never know. <laughs> Lord, help us today. How be it when he, I don't know if I'll ever let a women's seminar happen on the day before Sunday. The residue of the anointing is still in here. There's a lot of perfume too. How be it when he, when he, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth, when he has come, he will guide you. He will guide you. The Apostle Paul said, as many as are led by His Spirit, they are the sons of God. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will guide you. He will guide you. And He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear. In other words, He'll speak the Word. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Uh, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So that's the Word of God. The Holy Spirit does the will of God. Amen. Just like Jesus did the will of God, and does he ever lives today. The will of God. And Jesus is the Word made flesh. And the Holy Spirit, what he hears, he's talking about what he hears from God. What he hears from the, uh, the plan of God, the purpose of God, the Word of God, the ways of God. For your life, the Bible says, He will show you. He will not talk about Himself. He's not in there teaching about Himself. He's talking about how you can be led by the Spirit of God. Amen. He uses the term right here, guide. He will guide you. I'd like to tell you there is a lot of difference in, in just a, a travel agent versus a tour guide. Amen. Those are two different things. I am a travel agent for God. Amen. The Holy Ghost is the guide. Yes. Have you ever been somewhere and you've not been there before and it may be an area that you're a little bit nervous about being there uh, and, and you, you really want to make sure you have someone with you that knows all of the ways in and out of that place. Now, I don't need somebody telling me how to get out of a bind. I might need them to show me how to get out of a bind Amen. or how to guide me into something. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Amen. How many of you are glad that He, the third person of the Trinity, lives in you? Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Woo, I like this. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you. He will guide you. It's an interesting little Greek word. I'll give you another few of these today and, and tonight. O-D-E-G-O. 
O-D-E-G-E-O, actually. Uh, Odegeo. It means to show the best route. To guide you in the quickest, surest, safest direction. It means precise. It means fastest. It means to lead through unknown territory safely. It's a beautiful word. Oh, hallelujah. Anyone ever been in unknown territory? You ever been in a, in a very dangerous area in life, physically, financially, emotionally, socially, or whatever, maritally? I've got good news for you. The Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody shout Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Those are synonymous. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit will talk to you in here and he will guide you. He will guide you. He will guide you. You say, well, no, I don't fully understand. I'm going to show you this in a moment. I don't fully understand how the Holy Ghost can do that. How does the Lord do that? It's a learning process. He's the teacher and he'll teach you. But every person that's a Christian has the ability to hear the voice of God. Amen. Every person can hear the voice of God. Amen. You have two voices inside of you today. Every person has two voices. You have a right and a wrong voice, so to speak, that talks in you. You can call it a mental and a conscience. You can call it anything you want to. It's been called many things by uh, sociologists and psychologists and others. And uh, uh, I'd just like to tell you that you have a voice on the inside of you, the voice of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have you ever decided you were going to do something and another voice on the inside of you started coming up? Saying, well, maybe you should not do that. And you went ahead and, and did what the Holy Spirit was telling you not to do. And you look back and wish you had not done that. I mean, we just should not eat three pieces of chocolate pie. And your sugar go off the scale. Am I doing okay? One and a half maybe, okay. But three, get off of it. Especially if you have an issue there. Well, I'm just going to pray over this food and sanctify it. You cannot eat an entire uh, sweet potato pie by yourself, drink a half a bottle of syrup on those pancakes, on top of those nine pieces of bacon and four eggs and all the jelly you can slather on a biscuit. Am I talking to anybody? I should never talk about food on a Sunday morning, should I? We're going we're gonna to crush Denny's here in a few minutes. No, that's the Holy Ghost telling you. Not only is it common sense, it's the Holy Spirit telling you. You're like, but I prayed over and blessed it. Lord, I'm blessing this. And, and I'm like, I'm going to remember that at your funeral. I'm going I'm to pray that blessing over you. You must have been doing your epitaph. The Holy Ghost is telling you not to do that. I'm, come on, can we get real? Crying out loud. Man. Man, this is good preaching. For such a young preacher. How be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you, show you the best route in life. And the scripture says, he will show you things to come even. Watch what Jesus, the head of the church said, and he shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. Woo, I don't know about you, but I received that. Amen. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will receive of mine. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out. The apostle Peter gets up and begins to preach. He says, when they ask him, men and brethren, what does this mean? He said, this means what Joel said is come to pass. That in the last age, in the last days, the last age, in the last era, in the last dispensation, that's what you and I are in today, the church age, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy. They will have dreams and visions. Acts 1.8, you'll receive the power of the Holy Ghost when the Spirit of God comes upon you. And that's what Jesus is saying, that he will, you will uh, receive of mine and he will show it to you. 
And then Peter gets up and preaches when they said, men and brethren, what does this mean? He said, this means that that same Jesus which you uh, crucified has now shed forth or poured out that which you do now hear and see. The gifts of the Spirit, the nine manifestations of the Holy Ghost, those are part of the power and the ability of God that gets poured out. We'll get in that in another message and begins to come in you and on you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Jesus said that's what belongs to you, to every believer. Did you know that every one of the churches mentioned in the New Testament, in all of Paul's writings, today they would be called mega churches. They were all huge. They would start small and they grew to be very, very large. And did you know all of them believe that Jesus is Lord? A hundred percent of them. Did you know they all believed in the present day ministry of the Holy Spirit? Amen. Did you know that all of the churches in the New Testament spoke with other tongues Amen. as God gave them the utterance? Amen. Did you know that all of them believed in the nine gifts of the Spirit and the manifestations of the Holy Ghost? Some of them so much that the Apostle Paul had to put them in order like he did in 1 Corinthians. They understood the present day minister of the Comforter. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus said, I'll send you another comforter. How many of you are glad that Jesus is a comforter? And he said, I'll send you another comforter. In conclusion, I want you to hear this today. If somebody will come help me up here. In the book of, in the book of Romans, go to Romans 8 just for a moment, then I'll pick this up tonight. Some of you are going to want to know about it, and we may get over into the gifts of the Spirit in, in uh, 1 Corinthians later on, possibly even here tonight. Look at Romans chapter 8. Glory to God. Are y'all doing okay today? Yeah. Is this all right for a Sunday morning? Yeah. I want you so full of power this week that I don't care what happens, the Holy Ghost is going to guide you through it, yeah. guide you around it, over it or through it, whatever it takes. Yeah. You'll come forth victorious. Yeah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Look at verse 26, Romans 8, 26. Here, here, here's a 10-hour series. <laughs> Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Listen to it. The Holy Spirit helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Can I, can I just give you just a little touch for tonight? The word ought, O-U-G-H-T, is an interesting word. It's a Greek word uh, that the New Testament translated out of Greek into English for us. It's the word uh, day, D-A, day. And the word day literally means an obligation, a necessity, a requirement, an obligation, a necessity, a requirement. If you want to operate with the Holy Spirit, there's some things that are going to be necessary. Amen. He said, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what to pray for as is so necessary, that's so required. But the Spirit Itself, King James says itself is the exact word for himself. Listen to it. The Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. King James says, one translation says, with groanings and words that are not accessible or understandable to the speaker. We call it praying in tongues. Paul writes about it in several of his books uh, to the church. And he that searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Woo, Lord, help us in this. In these next, give me two minutes with it now. The Holy Spirit, when you pray and you do not know what to pray for or how to pray about something, and you are a believer. 
God, through the Holy Spirit, has given you a powerful prayer ability that goes beyond your intellect. I know some things that I think I need to pray for, but there's a lot involved with what I know to pray for that I don't know about that may be coming up, uh, coming up the trail. But the Holy Spirit, who's already been there, he, uh, he knows the, the past and he knows the future. He's already been there. And I'm, I'm now on page, uh, you know, like page 64 almost of my life. Let's say I have 120 pages. I'm on page 64, let's say. And I don't know everything about that. I do know some things because you, I have a mind. You have a mind. You have a will. You know some things you are going to do in all probability. You know some things that will happen. You know that. But there are a lot of things that you do not know that can or potentially can happen positively or negatively. Are you with me? But the Holy Spirit, when we begin to pray over what we do not know how to pray as is required or necessary, as we ought. Let me see if I can make this now where you understand it. The Holy Spirit makes intercession. Woo, what a word. We were in, were, were we at Cracker Barrel when we bought the little dog? Anybody ever buy a dog at Cracker Barrel? <laughs> it was so cute. It was just sitting there barking at us when we came in. Yip, 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 yip. But it's a toy dog and it requires batteries. So when we bought it and took it home and I put it out and turned it on, it, it was just dead. And then I turned it over and moved the hair, and guess what? You've got to add batteries. Well, we have the batteries at the house, and I thought, well, sure, that's easy. I'll just add the batteries real quick because it was required. It was necessary. If I want that dog to perform correctly, if I want it to speak to me, yip, 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 I'm going to have to do some things that were necessary. So I get in there. I mean, I am a man. I can fix anything with a screwdriver and a ball-peen hammer. Y'all know that. <laughs> Carburetor on the car, valve job, doesn't make any difference. Put a bicycle together. It doesn't need near as many parts as they sent. <laughs> and so here I, here I am trying to open this little bitty plastic door. Listen, I was about to call for the angels wanting to know if God was real. I'm so frustrated trying to get this thing off. Till finally I, I saw it had one little bitty screw. So I, I literally took my phone, found the screw, blew it up, went in and got this little bitty screwdriver that's like for glasses arms, you know, and came and real slowly undid that and pop, it just popped right up. But it was necessary it was required for me to do that so I could put the batteries in. Right. Then I put the batteries in, turned it on. Yip, 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 yip. See, so many times, that doesn't belong to me. It's for mercy and the kids and stuff. <laughs> That's my story. I'm sticking with it. And because there's a little kid in every boy. I don't care who you are. They still want it. So it, it was, it's necessary. The Bible says when we do not know how to pray, as we ought for things that we do not know about. The Holy Spirit helps our infirmity, which I'll teach on infirmity tonight, helps our inability by making intercession for us with groanings and utterances we do not understand. You know why it's so important to not just pray in your understanding but also to pray with other tongues? Because you're praying about what you know, but there's a lot that you do not know, and the Holy Spirit already knows that, and He knows the mind of God for you. And when you pray with other tongues and pray in the understanding according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 14 and 15, when you pray in other tongues, the Spirit of God through you and with you 
begins to pray the perfect plan of God. Can I say this? Can I say this? He begins to erase what's in the margin that's contrary to his plan for your life. Come on, give God the praise today. To learn more, visit WalterHallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you with your daily walk in Christ.